Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, and uh, I gave out all my own personal data. Inappropriate, of course. You need to be polite to me when you email me or tweet me. Uh, but I, uh, my book was given out earlier. Some of you have it. I hope all of you get the opportunity to read it. So I'm very interested in interacting with you guys about what's going on. I, I'm not sure if I'm an expert on, um, on the measurement crisis. So I'm sure someone's already made a joke that it sounds vaguely pornographic. Um, but it's the kind of joke which I think gets, gets, uh, gets a second or a third laugh because it's, it's so vulgar. Um, but speaking of numbers, the uh, event we have today is Audience Measurement 7.0, which is very ambitious. Uh, I'm from Silicon Valley. Uh, in Silicon Valley, we've only got to Web 3.0. So you guys on the East Coast, as always, are ahead of us, uh, at least in terms of your numbers. Uh, audience Measurement 7.0. So I begin this book, perhaps as all books should begin, at the beginning with Audience, audience Measurement 1.0. I begin the book uh, in London. I'm at the, the tomb, the public tomb of a, some of you may have heard of this guy, late 18th, early 19th century English social reformer and philosopher called Jeremy Bentham. Bentham was the father of utilitarianism that is otherwise known as a philosophy of maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. Uh, that, I don't know what he would make of the measurement crisis, but. Um, Bentham is, I think, the father of audience measurement. May not always be uh, used, perhaps, at, uh, at events like this, but nonetheless, we need to think of Bentham as forming the beginning of our industrial world in which everyone is watching everyone else. Uh, I begin my book, as I said, at Bentham's public tomb in London at University College, just off Gower Street. Some of you may have seen this. It's a it's an interesting cultural monument. Bentham left his body, in his mind, to the benefit of mankind, and it's been, public, it's been publicly on view for the last 180 years. Uh, it's not, of course, a real body. His head was severed and has been used as a footballer, as a football by various university college and London University uh, students. But the body's there. He wanted to leave it. He wanted to watch over us. Bentham is the father of audience measurement because he architected, and he uses this word, architecture. He defined it as um, a simple idea of architecture. He designed, he was in Russia uh, working for the enlightened despot, Catherine the Great. He architected something called the Panopticon, or the inspection house. It was a building, a physical building, a prison, a school, a factory, designed so that people could be watched all the time. It, of course, became a dystopia. It was actually put into practice uh, by Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler, still in practice today in North Korea. But it was premised on the idea that the more we're watched, the more we behave ourselves, the harder we work, the better for mankind. In my book, I describe the panopticon and the world that Bentham invented of the Industrial Age as the age of the Great Exhibition. So if we fast forward 170, 180 years, we get to what Reid Hoffman, the father of LinkedIn, calls Web 3.0, not Web 2.0. Anyone who's still using the term Web 2.0 um, is archaic. No one uses that term in Silicon Valley anymore. We've moved from Web 2 to Web 3.0. Web 3.0, as Hoffman says, and Hoffman should know, not only was the co-founder of LinkedIn, but an original investor in Facebook, the most networked, the most successful venture capitalist in the valley when it comes to social. Um, Hoffman describes Web 3.0 as an age of ubiquitous personal data, an avalanche, a, a tsunami, an endless flow of personal data. Now, you guys know about that. This is your measurement crisis. You are engulfed, enslaved, submerged 
in data, in all the personal data that is being um, flooded onto the internet. So what does this have to do with Jeremy Bentham? What does that have to do with the, great, the age of great exhibition? We've gone from Bentham's audience measurement 1.0 to audience measurement 7.0 because in our Web 3.0 age, we're living in what I call not the age of the great exhibition, but the age of great exhibitionism. The internet, this digital version of the panopticon, Bentham's dream that was put into practice in Russia and Germany, has been recreated, perhaps by accident, in our early 21st century digital world. Web 3.0 is, of course, made up of what I call in my book, the cult of the social. Every company that is being founded in Silicon Valley is social. Gentleman here is from Facebook. We all know about Facebook. We all understand that whether it's worth 60 or 100 billion dollars, it's still aiming to become the operating system of the social web, of Web 3.0. Whether it will or it won't isn't for me to say, but it certainly has as good a chance as any other company. But it's not just Facebook that is dominating, or that's, it's not just Facebook that is defining this social web, this digital panopticon. There are many hundreds, thousands of companies being born every month, every week, indeed every day in Silicon Valley, premised on this idea of social data. Companies that are built around um, social television, social learning, social music. Every time, increasingly, we go on the network, we're doing it in order to articulate, to broadcast our personal data. Whether we're telling the world what music we're listening to, what we're watching, TV is increasingly becoming social, whether it's to tell the world where we're going, where we will go, where we have been, what we're eating, how we're working out. We're living in increasingly, at least online, and I'm here to talk about online, of course, there is still a physical world, although it's shrinking fast. In the movie The Social Network, Sean Parker, the fictional Sean Parker, played by Justin Timberlake, is sniffing some cocaine off a young lady's chest. And he says very excitedly, first we lived in villages, then we lived in cities, and now we live on the internet. And in many respects, he's right. Bentham was describing the shift from the village to the industrial world. I'm here to tell you about this increasingly traumatic and I think um, uh, profound, at least, shift from the industrial to the digital world. Everything, then, is going social. The internet is becoming the place in which we articulate all our data. Now, of course, this should be, in many respects, from your point of view, many of you are in the advertising business, and you're all in the business, one way or the other, of leveraging, profiting, buying and selling that personal data. So this, in many respects, should be a nirvana for you. It should be a great moment for the advertising business. After all, people are doing it willingly. They're not being shoved into, into, into uh, uh, terrible prisons. It's not like in, in, in Bentham's day. People are doing this willingly. It's not the age of the great exhibition. People aren't being sent to Siberia. It's the age of great exhibitionism. People are choosing, happily it seems, to broadcast more and more intimate data, their photos, their movements. Julian Assange, a guy who should know this, said that he thought that Facebook could or should have been invented by the CIA. After all, they're doing a lot better business in terms of, well, you laugh, but it's true, they, they do a lot better business in terms of um, publicizing people's personal data. Again, you can't necessarily blame Facebook for it. I don't believe that Facebook is funded by the CIA although I'm sure some of their agents uh, bought the stock and lost, of course, because they're not in the know. Um, <laughs> anyone from the CIA here? I did a similar speech like this in Moscow where I, instead of the CIA, I talked about the KGB, and, and I made that joke, and there was no laughter. <laughs> but 
So this should be great for you guys. You should be dining on caviar, not chicken. <laughs> should be dancing in the street. You shouldn't even have to come to events like this because you all have your own island somewhere. But of course, along with this avalanche of personal data, this age of great exhibitionism, we have the measurement crisis. So we have two things going on simultaneously, in parallel. We have more and more personal data, and yet we have the measurement crisis. We have the crisis of there being too much data, and we have, I think, increasingly, the crisis, which some of you may have acknowledged, of increasing distrust between your industry or your industries and the consumer. Because while the consumer is happily whistling towards its funeral, giving out all its data, the consumer, the audience, in reality, is not happy about this. More and more resistance. I wrote a piece for face, anti-Facebook a couple of weeks ago on CNN. It got, and this is of course ironic, it's beyond irony, I don't know what word one would use for beyond irony, but it got almost 20,000 Facebook likes. <laughs> no joke, it led both CNN Global and International. It's one of their biggest pieces for years. 20,000 Facebook likes. That's just, that's just the Facebook likes. I couldn't even comment because I'm not on Facebook. So I couldn't comment on my own piece, which shows again how successful Facebook has been in trying to become the operating system of the internet. So what's going on? And again, you look on the cover of my book, uh, the back of the cover, my most enthusiastic supporter is Sir Martin Sorrell. Here's a guy who's the most powerful figure, or amongst the most powerful figure in the advertising industry. So my argument isn't necessarily against advertising. I think what I'm trying to say in the book is that we have a crisis, an advertising data crisis. We're destroying what I would describe as serendipity. The more we know about people, the more intimate we become with their data, firstly, the more they resent it, the more they distrust us, the more they switch off their online advertising, which means that you guys are having to deal with lower and lower rates, which means that advertising online is being commodified, which means that GM isn't happy with Facebook, which means that there still isn't a proven business model for online businesses, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or many of the other social startups. So the crisis is that advertising for all the personal data is not doing well. Now, there's a gentleman I was seeing next to at lunch who strongly disagreed. It's in his business to disagree, and I'm not denying that the advertising business is doing more and more business online. But I am seeing, from Silicon Valley at least, and from my connection in the content business, with more and more of a commodification of advertising, and more and more audience consumer resistance. So what's going on? I think the core thing that's going on is that advertising, in my view at least, is a serendipitous industry. It's based on surprise. I wrote a piece for The Atlantic this month in which I argued that social location apps like uh, Highlight and Glancy were destroying serendipity by trying to engineer it. These social location apps are ones we go on and strangers can connect if they share interests, if they're on the same network. They can connect if they have friends in common, if they have interests in common. It's based on engineering serendipity. And of course, that is the foundation of the online business, this data-intensive advertising industry that has grown up around the internet. It's all built on serendipity. But of course, it's the reverse of serendipity. Everywhere, I, 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 I was looking for a hotel on Jet Setter for this trip. 
Now, everywhere I go on the internet, I bump into Jet Setter. You all have had the same experience. I'm fairly careful in terms of do not track and working with my browser. I'm not on Facebook. I am on Twitter. But the internet knows me, or increasingly thinks it knows me, better than I know myself. Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, famously said a couple of years ago, in five years, I hope Google knows consumers better than they know themselves. And that, of course, is one of the consequences of this great intimate personal data deluge. Companies like Google and Facebook and many advertising companies and browser companies are knowing consumers better than they know themselves. But it's doing away with serendipity. It's doing away with surprise. And I think that we need to reintroduce surprise. Surprise can't be quantified. I was talking to somebody from, uh, from your conference before this event, and I said that you cannot quantify everything. Jeremy Bentham wanted to quantify everything. He wanted to create a metric of pleasure and pain. And Mark Zuckerberg, who is in many respects a latter-day version of Jeremy Bentham, also in Facebook tried to set up what he called a, a global pleasure and pain metric from Facebook to determine what we like and what we don't like. But my argument about human beings is more complex. It's more subtle. I don't believe, as Jeremy Bentham believed, that we are simply uh, algorithms of pleasure and pain, that we can be simply added up by what we like and what we don't like. I don't believe that we are the the, the, the data aggregations that so many internet companies are building us up into in our digital age. There was a guy in the middle of the 19th century called John Stuart Mill. Some of you may have heard of him, a very famous English philosopher. He began life as an acolyte of Bentham. But later, he even invented the term utilitarian. But later, he moved away from Bentham. He recognized that Bentham's concept of human beings was limited. He called it childish, as childish, perhaps, as the way in which Web 3.0 entrepreneurs like Mark Zuckerberg are conceptualizing the human condition. Zuckerberg wants to turn the internet into a well-lit dorm where we know everything about everybody else. Zuckerberg says we only have one identity. He, of course, wants to own that identity, to monetize it. But in reality, he's wrong. I know that, you know that, and, Jeremy, and John Stuart Mill knew that as well. John Stuart Mill wrote a very famous book in the middle of the 19th century called On Liberty, which I work off in my book. In On Liberty, Mill argues that we are complex individuals. We're not just a summation of pleasures and pains. We're defined by our sense of beauty, by our love of poetry, by our ability to stand apart from the crowd, we're defined by our resistance to one orthodoxy or another, whether it's the orthodoxy today of social media or the orthodoxy of utilitarianism in the 19th century. And I think that's what we collectively need to remind ourselves about in this world where everything literally can be known, where you are overcome, swamped in all this data, that we are, as human beings, more complex than the sum of that data. And that if we are to build an internet that's habitable, a place that we can comfortably live, Sean Parker says we live on the internet, and we know in many ways we do indeed live on the internet. If we're going to make it like that, we need to carve out a new space. Mill's book on liberty was an attempt to carve out autonomy, independence, privacy, for the individual in the collective age of the Industrial Revolution. And in many respects, he, he was successful. Mill's philosophy of individual rights represent the foundation, not only of Western democracy in Europe, but also in the US. We need, we're at a similar moment now when it comes to the internet. We need to carve out data-free zones. I just thought of that. Data-free zones. What does that mean? It means that we need to make the internet more human. 
This is being tried in many, many ways. I'm not here to trash the internet. I'm not here to tell you that you shouldn't be on Facebook, although you shouldn't. Um, <laughs> I'm not on it, uh, but then it's easy for me not to be on it because I sell books by not being on it. You guys need to be on it. And whilst many of us are online for narcissistic reasons, what I call digital narcissism, many of us are on it, and you know this because we have to be. This is the operating system of our knowledge economy. These digital platforms aren't there just for us to be narcissistic. They're there because this is how we do our business. Because as we have this shift from the industrial firm of the 20th century to a 21st century knowledge digital economy where we're more and more self-employed, free agent nation, so we're using these platforms not only to tell the world what we're having for breakfast or what we're wearing or for that matter not wearing, but also what services we have, how we can add value, how we can reinvent and invent ourselves. So what do we do? How do we make the internet habitable? I think we need to embrace technologies that make digital human. There's a technology, for example, being developed in the University of Eindhoven, which will enable data to degenerate. Now, some of you may have a stroke when you hear that. After all, data degeneration, what's going to happen to your business? But I think that's what people want. You guys did a fine business before digital. You can still have records. You can still have data. But the biggest problem with the internet, the reason why people are more and more uncomfortable with revealing everything about themselves, the reason why there's more and more tension and hostility between consumers and data gatherers like yourself is because people want the internet to learn how to forget. We need to help it learn how to forget. It's only going to be habitable when it knows how to forget. So whether that comes from new technologies or from government initiatives in Europe or the US, or whether it comes from new startups, every mean, duck, duck, go, companies which are making privacy the core of their products and services and apps, I think we need to support that. That doesn't mean that your industry is going to go away. That doesn't mean that you can't collect data. But I think, and I know you guys aren't making the decisions on what browsers to use or how the internet is sculpted or architected, but I think you have to recognize that enough is enough when it comes to all this collection of data. Microsoft, a couple of weeks ago, even came out with an announcement in, in their new browser, IE10, that a do not track feature would be the default on that so that consumers would automatically not be tracked, so that everywhere I go, I wouldn't be bombarded with jet setter ads. We need to recognize, I think, that, because otherwise, there really is a crisis. Otherwise, we are going to find that there is more and more human resistance to what is happening on the internet. This data deluge doesn't, to use a, um, an internet term, doesn't scale in the long term. You're seeing more and more resistance. You're seeing those 20,000 Facebook likes to my piece. You're seeing more and more of the smart kids getting off Facebook. You're seeing more and more privacy-centric companies. So where does that leave audience measurement 7.0? What happens to audience measurement 8.0 and 9.0 and 10.0? We need to carve out a space. We need to defend the privacy of the individual in our all too public age, in our age of great exhibitionism. That's what my book is really about, maintaining privacy, because I think if we don't, if all this data is transparent, if radical transparency becomes the operating system of our digital age, then we're losing something essential about what it means to be human. Now, I noted, and I hope this lady, or I think it's a lady, isn't here, but there was a, um, an, a, a presentation earlier today is how the brain goes social. Silence. Not funny. Is that person here? Not going to reveal themselves. I think we have to realize that the brain will never go social. 
that the cult of the social now washing over Silicon Valley benefits a small group of people, but doesn't benefit everyone. It doesn't even benefit you guys. That this idea that the brain goes social is absurd. We are, in a sense, social beings, but primarily we're individuals. We're not defined by who our relationships, but we're defined by our core. So we have a choice in terms of the way in which the internet and the data industry is evolving. One choice, I think, is to keep along this pace of avalanche of data, of publicizing everything, of destroying the distinction between the public and the private. And the other is by pushing back. I think we need to push back because if we don't, there will be a bigger reaction down the line. I'm not a Luddite, I'm as wired as anyone, but I think that future generations are going to react dramatically against this avalanche of personal data. So I think that we need collectively as an industry to draw a line in the sand about maintaining the autonomy of the individual and the privacy of the self to make the digital world more habitable. I hope that you guys will join in with this and not rely on purely quantifiable material and understand that serendipity which is the core both of content and advertising. The core thing which perhaps drives life, surprise, mystery, is not only key to our happiness and meaning as human beings, but is key to making the internet habitable. Serendipity is the thing that's most in crisis. So we may have a measurement crisis, but we've got a serendipity crisis. The world has been planned out. Everything is arranged. Too much is known about us. It's time to go back to a, a truly serendipitous age, an age where surprise and mystery, autonomy, secrecy are the things that define and drive human relationships and a human sense of the self. Thank you.